Wilbury splashing in that giant mud puddle and he just went down and rolled in one side of it. Did you get dirty enough, Maka? <laughs> his mud, like, look how deep the mud is up on his muzzle. And both Cobra and Posa rolled. So started that. Did she roll? We don't know. We gotta look. Well, this is the left side. No, I don't think I saw it. So Sione started, but Sione then started with her nose, and then like they were digging. Yeah. You see that part? The pawing out. Yeah. And then Cobra. And both Cobra and Posa rolled on their left side. On their left side, up to their eye, and they put their head. In. Yeah, their whole head is. Whole head. Uh, Interesting. It was like war paint. I just had this image of horses oh, with war paint. Oh yeah, it. because the Wet'suwet'en are involved in their fight against Canada and the RCMP for their mm -hmm. indigenous land rights and yeah true like putting on your war paint putting on your battle. war paint yeah are you guys standing with the Wet'suwet'en I think you are I think probably all the creatures of Canada are standing with the Wet'suwet'en sure right now what's going on yeah. I'm sure they can feel it. They're rumbling. The injustice. You do look kind of war pony like, don't you? But what are we talking about? What is happening with the Wet'suwet'en in Canada? Why are Indigenous peoples blocking the railways? And why it's important a path towards understanding? It can be hard to untangle the causes of the blockades and the indigenous people's anger. We live in parallel realities and know very little about each other. There are big parts of our history that we don't know. Many prejudices persist and are spread by the media. The media tend to focus on the consequences of the blockades and little on their causes. We need to take a look back in time. Imagine that you have a beautiful home and you welcome strangers who were lost. Then, without even saying thank you, they quickly take possession of the house, impose their laws on you, and lock you in the basement. How would you feel? Unfortunately, this metaphor shows too well the relationship between Canada and Indigenous peoples. Let's take a closer look. It starts in 1763 with a royal proclamation. This is the constitutional foundation for white indigenous relations. There's a recognition of nation status and the crown's responsibility to have consent when settling new lands. But in 1867, the Canadian Constitution Article 9124 says, the Parliament of Canada has exclusive legislative authority in relations with Indigenous peoples. And then, in 1876, the Savages Act, which later becomes the Indian Act. The objective of this act is the dispossession of Indigenous territory and assimilation of the people. Indigenous peoples are placed under the guardianship of the state. Then in 1982, we have a repatriation of the Constitution, and the existing ancestral or treaty rights of Indigenous peoples are recognized and confirmed. In 1997, a Supreme Court judgment recognizes the ancestral rights of Indigenous peoples over their territories as well as their traditional leadership. This means that unceded territories are under Indigenous jurisdiction. Northern British Columbia is home to indomitable people on unceded territory. The Unistaden camp was built in 2010. The aim is to make their presence on their territory visible, even though they have occupied it for more than a thousand years. This is a way of protesting against the threat of pipelines that several industries want to pass through their 22,000 square kilometer territory, which it should be remembered is recognized as belonging to the Wet'suwet'en nation under its jurisdiction. The Wet'suwet'en have many reasons to be concerned about pipelines. As nomadic people on an extremely rich territory, their lifestyle is intimately linked to fishing, hunting, trapping. These projects threaten the entire ecosystem. How is a moose supposed to cross a pipeline? A few years ago, there were three million salmon coming up the rivers. Each family had enough to get through the winter. This year, there were 10,000. 
for a distribution of two fish per house. Because we have a relationship with the land, we are the first to see the changes. We are the canaries in the mine. The current threat is called the Coastal Gas Link Project. It's a 670 kilometer pipeline to transport shale gas to an LNG terminal for export to Asia. It's a $40 billion project. It equals 8 million tons of carbon dioxide, 856,831 new cars, 5% of BC's carbon dioxide emissions. Shale gas results in soil fragmentation, uses a lot of water, Toxic products are used and not disclosed. There's a risk of impact on water tables, and it's less profitable. While Canada is far from meeting its carbon dioxide reduction targets for 2030, it is imperative to reduce emissions from the most polluting sectors, namely the production of fossil fuels, petroleum consumption in transportation. This project will increase both. Yes, but the band leaders have agreed to the pipeline, so where's the problem? Well, according to the indigenous leadership that prevails here, again, the Delgamuk decision 1997, the territory in question is not under the jurisdiction of the band council, but under that of the hereditary chiefs. Let's look at the difference. The band chiefs work under a system imposed by colonization derived from the Indian Act. They deal with the day-to-day -day affairs of the community and the territory of the reserves. The hereditary traditional chiefs work under a traditional system that survived colonization despite all efforts to eliminate it. They take care of the whole ancestral territory and have as their role to protect it for the next seven generations. It can happen that the same person plays both roles, which can be confusing, but this is not the case here. Is it a real choice? Let's see. Do you want a pipeline? Yes, we're going to give you money. No, we're not going to give you anything, and we're going to do it anyway. Remember, endemic poverty on underfunded reserves can be a major incentive to say yes. The government's tactic of addressing the wrong authority is revealing. They are looking to impose a project still and to divide a strategy that has proven its worth in the past, but the indomitable Wet'suwet'en do not intend to let this happen and continue to defend their rights and their territory in a peaceful way, armed with their drums and sacred chants. We defend our territory for everyone. Their customs and cultures have long been forbidden, and we can only salute their resilience and strength to be still here today despite the efforts of white people to relegate them to the realm of folklore. February 10th, 2020, the invasion. A ceremony took place at Unistoden camp to honor the memory of missing women and girls. For it must be remembered that more than 1,200 indigenous women have gone missing or been murdered in Canada since 1980 against a background of general indifference. This situation can be described as a real genocide. But I digress. The RCMP decides that this ceremony is a good time to intervene and impose an injunction allowing the industry to take over the territory. Helicopters, weapons of war, dogs, many repressive methods are used. Seven people are arrested in the middle of their singing. The media is muzzled. Fortunately, the scene was documented. The land defenders are treated as criminals, and this is the image desired by their opponents. Side note on the RCMP. It is relevant to note that the RCMP, formerly the NWMP, was basically created to control indigenous populations and quell rebellion. It was also in charge of picking up kidnapping would be a more appropriate term, the children to take them to residential schools where they were prevented from speaking their languages, practicing their customs, and not to mention the widespread abuse they experienced. They stole the children from the land. Now they steal the land from the children. It is therefore a very tense relationship between Indigenous peoples and the RCMP, and its presence on their territory is in itself an act of aggression. To add insult to injury, people from the industry invaded the territory as soon as the RCMP made arrests. This contemptuous intervention was the spark that ignited the fire. 
Indigenous people across the country unite in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en. They are disrupting the rail system across the country and showing us their strong impact while remaining nonviolent. Using this pressure tactic is not insignificant since the railways played a crucial role in Canadian colonial history. They are calling for the recognition of Indigenous governance. It is their right to exist that is threatened. Yes, it's true. The blockades are causing significant inconveniences, but this is nothing compared to the prejudice and disrespect that Indigenous peoples have suffered since colonization. Reminder, to date, 56 communities still do not have access to clean drinking water, not to mention the dangers that await us if we continue to approve these kinds of projects. Reconciliation, long awaited, won't happen through the government, but through the people. Let's acknowledge our history and change what follows for the future. We were more than 500,000 people in the streets of Quebec demonstrating for the planet. Today, Indigenous peoples need our support to protect the land and their cultures. They have so much to teach us. We have no more time to lose. This makes no sense. What can I do? Listen to what groups have to say and what they need. Get informed. You can also get informed. And most importantly, get informed. Don't upstage communities and take the microphone for them. Show your support. Go see the Wet'suwet'en Allies Toolbox at the address listed below. Solidarity with Indigenous people. Your muzzle's all muddy too. No, I'm not kissing with you now. <laughs> no way. She's like, well, how about you rub my belly then? Maybe that I can do.